Hello and welcome to our lecture on Cnidaria and Tenophora. This has to be one of my favorite topics that we're going to cover this semester, uh, definitely in my top five. So uh, let's get started. This is chapter 13 of your textbook. So what are Cnidaria and Tenophora? Uh, they are organisms that have a soft body except for corals and um, they're generally made of like 95% water. So they're very gelatinous and, and very soft. They can have both a sessile or motile uh, form of lifestyle. And um, they're, even if they're motile, they're really not that strong as swimmers. So generally they can't really fight the currents with the exception of some very you know, large um, cnidarians, but generally they're pretty small and um, they're not that strong. So they can't fight heavy currents, but they are modal. They're diploblastic. So this is our first uh, phyla of organisms that we've moved from the um, uh, things having one tissue layer, so just ectoderm. So now we're in uh, animals that are diploblastic. So our cnidaria and tenophora con are composed of an ectoderm and an endoderm, and they um, undergo gastrulation in the in early development to develop either an incomplete gut or complete gut, depending on if you're talking about cnidaria or tenophora, and um, the ectoderm will become the epidermis and the endoderm becomes the gut. So just as a reminder. Cnidaria and tenophora generally um, exhibit two types of symmetry, either radial or biradial. And some examples that you're probably familiar with are anemones, jellies, and um, comb jellies. So we're going to start by talking about cnidarians first, and this includes this phylum includes a couple of organisms that you're probably familiar with, um, including hydras, sea anemones, jellies, or um, we might also call them jellyfish, but generally in, in science we call them jellies now, um, and your horny coral and your stony coral. Cnidarians are named after this particular. Um, cells that they have called a nidocyte. And the nidocyte is what holds the nematocyst. So uh, if you look at the word nidocyte and cnidarian, you see they clearly got their name from these particular cells. And this is a unique characteristic of this phylum. This is the only phylum that have these nidocytes. Um, other organisms that consume cnidarians can sometimes repurpose those nidocytes, but these are the only ones that make them in, um, naturally. Most cnidarians are marine, but you can also have some that are freshwater, so you can have some that live in rivers and estuaries and things like that. And uh, many of them engage in symbiotic relationships with other organisms. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about coral reefs and zooxanthellae or zooxanthellae um, that live within the, the tissues on coral reefs, but you can also have certain invertebrates uh, that will use cnidarians as protection. So like um, in your book, they mentioned that some crabs will um, take sea anemones and then stick them on themselves and use them as protection as they're going throughout their life. So um, it's really interesting to think about these commensal and mutualistic relationships that cnidarians have with other organisms. Some common classes um, that uh, you can actually see in this phylogenetic tree include hydrozoas. Um, these are your hydras and your Portuguese man o' wars, which are some things you may or may not have heard of. Um, your cyphozoas, which are your true jellies, uh, cubozoa, which are your cube jellies, and anthrozoa, which are your anemones and your corals. But in total, there are six major classes within this phylum, and um, they include anthrozoa, mixozoa, starozoa. Uh, cyphozoa, cubozoa, and hydrozoa. So um, when they get later into this presentation, we'll talk about each of these classes separately. But um, from this phylogenetic tree, I also want you guys to take a good look and remember these homologous characteristics that um, are uh, shared amongst all cnidarians. So they have a mouth surrounded by uh, tentacles, they have a not they have nidocysts, which we talked about. They have radial symmetry, um, and then they also have a uh, planural larva. So these are all the homologous characteristics. So and then just take a look at these different classes and the uh, characteristics that um, that uh, are shared or homologous characteristics for each of these these classes.
Cnidarians are dimorphic, meaning that they have two type of body plans. They have a polyp form, which is a sessile hydra, and then they have a medusa form, which is what we normally think of as the kind of umbrella-shaped jellies here. And this image shows you both those forms. So the, the polyp type um, is you know this kind of tree looking hydra and then the medusa type is the uh, umbrella type so first we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about the polyps so polyps have a tubular stalk and tentacles that surround their mouth so this is their stalk so they have a you know a, a tube like stalk system and then they have a mouth that is in the middle um, of kind of in the center of that stalk and then they have tentacles that surround that stalk and in the middle of the stalk here is where they have their gut Gut. and um, food goes in the mouth and into the gut and gets digested from there and then any extra large waste will have to come out the same way it went in so it's like an incomplete gut or a blind gut Polyps can reproduce asexually through, via budding or via fission, um, but they also can reproduce through petal laceration. And what this is, is essentially the uh, polyp is anchored to the substrate down here via what they call a petal. Um, and then if you break off a piece of that petal and um, move it somewhere else, or if that some of these polyps are a little bit a little bit modal, they if they move from place to place or they get displaced, and part of the petal remains, then um, that will actually become another polyp in itself. So, um, buds of the polyp can um, stay attached to the colony, and this will um, this can stay attached to the parent, and this will form a colony, and the colony will have a shared gut. So, to give you guys an example. Let's say I had a, a, a polyp here, my crude drawing, but um, and then I have a bud that buds off of this polyp. Okay, this comes our, our offspring, right? Those two will share a common, common gut system. So they'll share this whole area for food digestion, okay? Um, Polyps are, can be specialized for different things. So not all polyps that bud off will do the same function. Some polyps will go on to be feeding polyps, which is kind of the example that I drew. Others will become polyps that are responsible for reproduction. So they'll be responsible for um, making medusas um, or depending on the species, releasing the eggs and sperm. And then some of them are for defense. And then, um, So the second half of being dimorphic are the uh, medusa form. So the medusa form is, I mentioned the kind of umbrella, normally what you think about is jellyfish type form. Their mouth, instead of being on this side of the organism is actually on the underside of the mouth. So I mean, on the other side of the umbrella. So this would be the mouth here in this cross section. And then they have uh, tentacles around the rim here. They also have sensory organs that help them with um, their orientation to light, and they, some of them have um, sensory organs that help them with equilibrium and things like that. And uh, medusa forms undergo sexual reproduction. So polyps are asexual reproduction, and then um, medusa are the sexual reproducing uh, part of the life cycle. So looking more closely at the life cycle, um, for scientists, one of the major questions is which came first, the polyp or the medusa, right? So there's evidence out there. Some people think the medusa came first, some people think the polyp came first. But um, in any case, that's something that scientists are really trying to figure out now is which form of this life cycle was the, the first to arise. But going through this um, life cycle here, we start with our polyp which is remember our sessile uh, form. And they, uh, they will kind of bud, they have some buds that are responsible for reproduction depending on the species. And some of them, um, their polyp form does only one function and it forms the medusa. So the polyp will start to transform and it will start to form these medusa, but they're all kind of stacked together. So that's what this is showing you. Um, each of these layers, so this is a layer, and then this is a layer, and this is a layer. Right, each of those layers is a medusa. And the ones on the top, 
of this stack are the most mature. So once ready, the most mature medusas will um, detach from the stock. And that's what this is showing you here. And they will mature in the water column. So remember they're modal as they're swimming through the ocean, you know, eating plankton and things like that. They will start to develop into a young medusa and then into an adult medusa. And an adult medusa is more kind of what we normally will think of and, and you know, see in aquariums and things like that. And then um, once the medusa is ready to reproduce, um, they will either form sperm or egg. Um, some of them can form both and uh, their sperm and egg will go undergo fertilization and you get a nice fertilized egg, which will then form a larva. And then the larvae are uh, free floating and they're, they're motile and um, they can then attach to a substratum and go back to the polyp stage. So this is kind of the general life cycle of, um, of a cnidarian. Now this does vary per species, but it's important to know just the general life cycle of the polyp form, um, how they develop into a medusa, and then how the medusa are able to kind of go back to the polyp form. One also interesting thing that uh, scientists are looking into right now are the um, Hox gene homologs that are present in the larva. So, you know, we talked about Hox genes and how Hox genes help with orientation along the anterior posterior axes in um, more, what we would say, more complex animals, right? But we actually see some um, anterior posterior Hox genes that are on a more and more simple level in these larvae for uh, cnidarians. So people, uh, tax taxonomists and biologists have been looking at the Hox genes that are in these larvae to learn more about how maybe Hox genes came to be and how they uh, have gained in complexity in more complex animals. The anatomy of cnidarians is actually quite interesting, especially considering how simple organisms these organisms are. So um, as I mentioned before, they're diploblastic, meaning in early development, they have an ectoderm and an endoderm. And uh, their ectoderm later becomes their epidermis, and then their endoderm later becomes their gastrodermis. In this image, you can see those here. Their epidermis is represented as this purple cell layer, and then this uh, yellow cell layer in this image is their gastroderm. And in the middle of these two, we have something called the mesoglia. And the mesoglia is uh, it's not a tissue, it's actually just an extracellular matrix that lies between the gastrodermis and the epidermis, and it's composed of 95 to 90% water. Um, and its purpose is to provide structure and support for the animal so that it uh, has the, the shape that we see when we look at these animals. Um, we also can have interstitial cells um, in the epidermis. And these are essentially undifferentiated stem cells, and that can become whatever type of cell that the organism needs later on. So they can become a nitoblast, which will give rise to natasis. Um, they can become sex cells. They can become note cells, almost any type of cell, with the exception of epithelial muscular cells. Those replicate themselves, so these interstitial cells won't become those. So one really interesting question um, when it comes to cnidarians is how are they able to move? So um, going back to our lecture, I think it was like the second or third uh, lecture we had in class, we talked about um, the different types of tissues that arrive from the ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. So just a reminder, the ectoderm gave rise to the epidermis and then the nerve system, and then your endoderm uh, gave rise to your gastric tissues, and then your mesoderm is where the majority of the other tissues in the organism arise, so including your muscle cells. And in these organisms, they're able to move, but they have no mesoderm, which means they have no muscles that are derived from mesoderm. So the question is, how are these organisms able to move without muscles? And they're able to solve this through the use of these epithelial muscular cells. And essentially, these cells serve two purposes. They're epidermis uh, cells, so they have that outer covering of the organism and protection, but they're also muscular cells. So at their base, um, which is kind of hard to see in these pic pictures, but you see these pink dots are trying to show you the myofibers that are that lie at the base of the, um, the cells. And you can actually see it a little bit better in this image. These are the uh, epithelial muscular cells. All right, these pink columnar cells, and at their base are these myofibers. 
And when a organism is uh, stimulated, um, when it wants to move, it will uh, send signals into these epithelial muscular cells and that will cause the myofibers to contract, which allows the organism to move um, away from predator or move towards prey or however uh, they need to move. Uh, these organisms have something very, very interesting called a nerve net. And the nerve net is a, a kind of a web system of nerve, uh, nervous tissue that uh, is in within cnidarians. There is no central nervous system, so there, it's not like they have a brain or anything like that. They're just able to coordinate um, their nerves. Some species do have kind of like a, a rudimentary almost like a rudimentary central nervous system, but not quite. Um, it'll have like a, a very dense area where the nerves meet, but there is no central nervous system to speak of. The nerve net is uh, located at the base of the epidermis and the gastrodermis. So you can actually see it in the, the first image we were talking about. So they, they show um, kind of any of this blue region here that's kind of spanning both the gastrodermis and the epidermis is trying to show you the the nerve net. And th it's responsible for transmitting synapses throughout the entire organism. So let's say you are a, um, a hydra and there is a, a predator nearby and you need to, to move away from the predator or fight back in some way. So the sensory cells that are located on the epidermis will uh, get that signal that you need to move and it'll send that signal through the nerve net and then the nerve net um, it synapses with the epithelial muscular cells and also synapses with your gastrodermal cells to coordinate um, a movement so that the organism can move away from the predator or fight back. And this nerve net is really important uh, landmark in research looking at uh, the development of the, of the nervous system as we know it in like mammals and more complex organisms because um, we actually still have some semblance of a nerve net in our bodies, in our intestinal tract. So this kind of lets us know that the nervous system evolved very early in uh, animal evolution and um, kind of through studying the nerve net, we can kind of understand how we ended up with the complex nervous systems that we see in animals today. Nidocytes are undoubtedly what cnidarians are most famous for. Um, nidocytes can develop within invaginations in either the ectoderm or the endoderm. And because uh, I, I say that because um, we know, we most time think of these nidocytes on the outside of the organism, but some species also have nidocytes that will be present within the gut. And there are over 20 types of these nidocyte cells. And not all of them are for stinging prey. Some of them are adhesive um, and they're used for attachment. So not all of them are for uh, stinging things or are or, or painful. But the one that we're most probably familiar with, especially if you've ever been stung by a jellyfish in the ocean, are the nematocysts. And these are the type of nidocytes that when they're triggered, they inject paralyzing toxin into the prey um, or the predator in order to you know, fight back. And so in our case, when we get stung, they're not trying to eat us. They're, they stung us because uh, we're probably like the predator. Um, but really, in actuality, more than likely, we just triggered their... Uh, their nidocytes to, to, um, to go off. So how does this process work? So this is an example of a untriggered nematocyst. And so you have something called a nidocyl, which is this very little like hair-like trigger here. So I think it's a modified flagella and it's a, uh, it can be a mechanoreceptor in some um, in some species that we just talked about, it can be the organism senses something chemical and then it will send a signal down to the nematocyst to um, fire. But in this case, we'll just talk about the general gist of um, the nidocyl is triggered. And within this uh, pocket here, there is a high osmotic pressure and tensional force. And the tensional force comes from this, this wound up region here. And so there it's everything is kind of like built up, right? It's a lot of pressure that's built up within this uh, this uh, pocket here, and it's basically ready to explode at any moment. And there's a cap 
that's keeping all of this closed called the uh, upper operculum and uh, that's basically keeping everything together so um, as soon as that nidocil is triggered it'll cause a rush of water to come into the the chamber and this rapid increase in hydrostatic pressure forces that uh, barb to just shoot out right and so um, it shoots out into its target in the case of a nematocyst and then will inject toxin into that prey target um, a more a really good uh, video showing you how this process works kind of visually is included at the end of this PowerPoint but essentially the nidocil is triggered and that and then there's a lot of pressure that's already built up in that nat that nidocyte and once that trigger is 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 um, is let off a lot of water will rush into that pocket and cause basically to just shoot out like a bullet into whatever organism uh, is unfortunate enough to be the one that gets stung a nidocyte can only be used once so once they're recharged they have to be um, reabsorbed and then a new nidocyte has to be made to replace it Nidarians are carnivorous. Um, they do hunt prey. It's not nearly as epic sometimes as a, a lion chasing a gazelle, but they can be kind of interesting when they're hunting prey because some of their prey can actually be much, uh, not super large, but a considerable size uh, larger than them or a considerable size compared to them. Um, and they can sometimes even be smarter, like fish would be considered smarter than a Nidarian, but they can easily catch and eat them. So um, how does this process work? Well, let's use this um, hydra as an example. So the uh, let's say that, let's say there's a crustacean in the water. Drop plankton. Okay, there's a there's a crustacean in the water, and it is unfortunate enough to touch one of the tentacles on this hydra. Well, that hydra can then use its nidocytes to um, inject a toxin to paralyze that prey. And then it'll use its tentacles to bring that prey into the mouth, which is located here. And it's at the, you know, the center of this kind of halo of um, tentacles. So it'll bring that prey in the mouth and bring it into the gut. Okay. And in the gut, um, the cells, the gastrodermal cells, will release enzymes that will break down that prey into kind of smaller, more manageable pieces. And then the gastrodermal cells will then uh, phagocytose and uptake those um, broken down pieces of prey and further break them down. For, so for nutrients to be absorbed. So there's two processes occurring here. There's external or extracellular, sorry, extracellular digestion that occurs in the gut. And then you have intracellular digestion that occurs within the, uh, ga uh, the gut lining, the gut cells. Um, corals can sometimes supplement uh, their nutrition with uh, carbohydrates from symbiotic algae. So this is very, very common in corals and, and sea anemones, and we'll talk about that a little bit um, towards the end of this presentation. So there are many, many classes, like we talked about, there are six classes of cnidarians, and uh, just to give you guys some information about each of those classes, um, we're going to start with hydrozoa. So hydrozoans are uh, what we normally think of as this, these hydras. And so this is a good example of a hydra that's uh, from your textbook. But you also can have some uh, medusas as well. And so they have a, um, their hydras or their polyps are the asexual form and their colonial. So this is showing you a colonial image of hydras because all these hydras are living in a in a colony together. And they also have a sexual medusa form. So this image here is actually a Portuguese man o' war and um, they would be, they have an interesting way of going about themselves, but they are sexual and they have polyps that hang around on them as well. In some species, the medusa will remain attached um, to the polyp and then just release gametes. So in some species, you won't even see that kind of umbrella um, form of the the cnidarian they'll just stay attached like we saw before where there was kind of uh, the medusas were kind of layered on there kind of like this let's say uh, the one the medusas 
stays attached and just releases gametes in that way to reproduce sexually. Um, some don't even have a medusa phase at all. So they will reproduce um, asexually or um, be like we talked about, the medusa just never leave. They eat crustaceans, worms, and larvae, and this is pretty consistent across a lot of the cnidarians uh, classes. They have relatively small medusa. Um, the, the really, really big ones we're going to talk about next in a different uh, class. They have something called a vellum. And the vellum is essentially, if you have a, a jellyfish that looks like this, they have kind of like a little shelf that bends in at the bottom of their bell. And this tentacles, right? And that, that shelf actually helps them to propel themselves through water. So as they, they take in water and when they push the water out through that smaller surface area, it allows them to um, propel themselves forward more efficiently than um, cnidarians that don't have a vellum. Oh, and also they have a nerve ring that is around the, their, the base, um, which also helps with the, the propulsion and, of the, and the efficacy of the vellum. They have a, um, well, we see this word quite, come up quite a bit, and something for you to remember is a stratocyst, and this helps them with equilibrium. So as I mentioned before, they can have some sensory cells that will play a role in finding light and, and where and equilibrium and where they are within their environment. Um, a stratocyst is responsible for that. And in this case, they also can have an um, ocelli, and this is helping them um, find light. Some of them have smooth muscle and striated muscle, which is derived from ectoderm. And uh, this is kind of what we were talking about where this system is kind of weird. Like cnidarians are kind of the next step at looking at um, tissues because they don't have a mesoderm. Some of them do have muscle. So it's like, but it's derived from endo, I mean, ectoderm. So you can kind of see when you look at the evolutionary tree, how things might have branched off and, and common ancestors and homologous traits through kind of going through um, organisms as you look at increasing complexity. Some examples, like we mentioned, are like the Portuguese man o' war. They're actually quite beautiful. Um, if, you, if you're not really familiar with them, I would look them up on the internet. They're very, very beautiful, um, but you do not want to get stung by these. These are the kind that can send you to the hospital. Then we have our cyphozoas. Um, these are generally our larger jellyfish. So in that first, uh, that second slide that comes after the introduction, um, there's a giant um, jellyfish that you can see the little diver next to it. The jellyfish is massive and it actually belongs to this class. And, uh, but even though they do have some larger ones, the vast majority of them in this category and this class are actually small, but um, those large ones are pretty cool. They don't have a vellum, uh, so they're unlike hydrozoas, they don't have a vellum, but they do have a scalloped umbrella. Um, so you can see here how this uh, moon jelly, its its uh, umbrella kind of goes in like this, and it kind of almost has like a little flower type shape to it. Um, and at each of those points, they actually have sensory organs. So um, that makes helps them, you know, sense their environment. And they generally have four oral arms that are around their gut, um, around their gut pouch. And they have two nerve nets, one that's responsible for pulsation and the other one that's responsible for everything else. Uh, they do um, have nidocytes that are all over their body. And these are one of those examples that I was talking about where they have nidocysts in uh, side of their gut cavity. So they have them there so that once they eat prey, they can continue to uh, sting any prey that's still struggling. Some species will skip the polyp stage altogether and go straight to a medusa. And some examples that you probably are familiar with are your moon jellies. Um, when you go to the aquarium, these are a lot of times the ones that they have in the tanks that show uh, different colors. Um, they're pretty clear. So they look really cool when you shine them with different colors of light. And then your uh, Cassiopeias, which to me are one of my fav personal favorites, and that's the actual upper image there. And um, the, the Aurelia or the moon jellies can actually catch their prey using um, mucus that's on the outside of their body. And uh, then they use cilia to brush that um, 
prey into their mouths. And um, Cassiopeia um, do a similar thing. And they also contain Zuzanthelli. So that's why this, this image is so beautiful is because it actually has a photosynthetic organism that's uh, associated with them that allows them to be this beautiful color. Next, we have our uh, Starzoa. The things to remember about them is there uh, is no Medusa phase. They're all only polyps and they reproduce sexually. So a little bit of uh, both of what we were talking about before we had mentioned that Medusa are the sexual um, or the sexual form of the life cycle and the polyp was asexual. And in this case, the polyp is the only form of their life cycle and they re reproduce sexually. And we have a cubozoas. Um, this is in this class, the uh, Medusa is prominent and it's there's some for some species, there's little to no evidence of a polyp at all. So the Medusa is just the vast majority of the um, organisms that you'll find in this class. And the bell is kind of in a square shape, which is why they're called cubozoa. So if you look at this animal, this uh, picture down here, you can kind of see the cube shape here. A lot of times people will call them box jellies. Um, they're not quite a square, but they're most the most square-ish ones. Um, one really cool thing about them is they have eyes, and some of their eyes can actually be pretty complex. Um, they have three types of eyes, so six in total. And one of their eyes is actually uh, has a lens. So this image up here is showing you kind of what their eye looks like, and it's a relatively complicated eye for this, such a simple organism. They also have a scalloped umbrella with a, a velarium, which is almost like a vellum, but not quite, but it does function in the same way to help propel them through the water more efficiently. And um, these, you don't wanna get stung by these either. Um, their stings can be even fatal to humans. Um, so most people know about box jellies because they're like, those are the ones you definitely don't want to get stung by. Um, and then, yeah. Um, next we have a uh, Mixozoa. And these are a uh, class of cnidarians that are exclusively parasitic. And they cause something called whirling disease in fish. So this is what they look like. They're really, really small. They don't even, if you looked at them, you wouldn't even think that they were cnidarians. And they, they were actually recently uh, classified as cnidarians and they can harm fish through this whirling disease including commercially viable fish like trout and salmon and you can see in these fish this part of their tail looks heavily deformed and that's due to this parasite so um they can be these this particular class um can be very cumbersome when it comes to um, economies that rely on fishing and also economies that rely on tourism related to uh, competitive fishing and things like that. Then we have our anthrozoas, one of my personal favorites, which probably many people's favorites. Um, they are include our sea anemones. They have flower-like polyps, so they look beautiful, like almost like undersea um, flowers and there are no medusa stages so they all are uh, sessile and polyps and they generally have a geometric um, a geometric type of formation there be an uh, sex semix of six or segments of eight and that includes inside their gut so not just on the outside but even within their gut they'll have uh, chambers that can be within uh, even numbers and then some have an exoskeleton and some don't, and some have an endoskeleton and some don't. So when we talk about an exoskeleton and endoskeleton, I don't mean made of bone, I mean of made of lime or calcium carbonate, um, like as in kind of corals and things like that, not necessarily anemones so much. Uh, they can be modal um, to an extent. So they're not floating around in water a lot, but there has been evidence of sea anemones that are under attack will detach their base plate, their petal, and kind of inch off um, to get away from prey. And it's actually kind of funny watching them kind of wiggle away from, uh, sorry, away from predators to get away from the predators. And they have symbiotic relationships with zoothanthelli as well, as well as other species. And like I mentioned, this includes our sea anemones and our corals, our spiny corals and our soft corals, etc.
Speaking of coral reefs, uh, we'll take a little bit of time to talk about coral reefs because it's especially important to um, various economies and to life and biodiversity as we know it. So just as I mentioned, uh, coral reefs are part of the class Anthrozoa and they actually form a calcium carbonate layer um, beneath their living tissue. So if you have a, a coral, let's say we have a coral that looks like that, um, all of this area will be calcium carbonate that's built up over thousands of years um, of organisms just kind of growing in layers. And it's almost like a tree, like there's a, a layer of living cells on the outside. So this, this green is supposed to represent a layer of living cells, living polyps on the outside. And then as they you know, die and, and form more um, calcium carbonate, they'll become more and more layers. So you can actually kind of age a coral almost like you would age a tree. Um, the, some of the most important corals, there are very various types out there, very many, many species, but one of the most important as far as coral reef building goes are our hermatic um, corals. And corals are especially sensitive to environmental conditions. So they have, they're very important, as I mentioned, because of biodiversity. Um, I think it's 20% or 25% of all marine life raise their young, breed, live, um, do something, a part of their life cycle in coral reefs, including those that are very um, important to humans that we eat or that we like to fish recreationally, et cetera, et cetera, right? And, um, but they're under threat because they're very sensitive to environmental conditions and what's happening to our environment, it's changing, right? So with global warming and uh, climate change, we're seeing more coral bleaching. So coral bleaching is when you have the zooxanthellae that are um, photosynthetic microorganisms. And in this picture, it's showing you all these like orange dots are actually bacteria, photosynthetic bacteria that are residing within the tissues of the polyp. And the polyp benefits from getting the sugars from the uh, microorganism as they undergo photosynthesis. And the organism benefits because it gets protection from the elements, right? So the zooxanthellae allow for corals to look like this, to have this beautiful colors. This is a sign of a good, healthy coral, right? Um, and But what happens when you have global climate change is uh, the water temperature is becoming warmer and warmer. These zooxanthellae don't survive under all conditions. Some can handle more uh, warmer conditions than others, but at a certain extent, they, they start to die off and, or they're um, photosynthetic, their process, process of undergoing photosynthesis becomes damaged and it starts to produce these oxidative uh, radicals. And when that happens, that actually damages the polyp. So that causes the polyp to release its um, zooxanthellae out of the tissues in order to help save itself from the oxidative stress that um, is coming from these bacteria. Well, the problem with that is they need the zooxanthellae to survive. And so what happens is as they release more and more of the zooxanthellae, that these corals will go from looking like this beautiful orange color to looking like this white color. And that's essentially because they've lost all their zooxanthellae and this coral is essentially dead at that point. Um, zooxanthellae has been found that once they leave, they don't come back. So it's kind of just downhill for this coral from there. The coral reefs are economically important for a couple reasons. I just mentioned that, well, I had mentioned that um, it's important for commercial fish and then also for fish that we eat because a lot of them spawn within cor uh, coral reefs or they uh, live within them but they're also important for tourism right people thousands of people go every year to australia to go to the great barrier reefs um, they're beautiful not even just there there's great there's reefs all over in the tropics um, i've been to one too i traveled specifically to go see reefs um, they're really good for ec economies that rely on tourism. And they're also good for people who rely on selling goods. People make jewelry and, and uh, other goods out of um, pieces of coral. Uh, 
So once these corals are dead, we not only lose biodiversity, but we also lose out economically and um, and even this our society is made less for it. The last phylum we're going to talk today about today, uh, you may be a little bit less familiar with. They're called Tenophora, and um, you might have heard of comb jellies, but that's essentially what these are. And they're called comb jellies because they have eight rows of cilia that line their body. And so this image is kind of hard to see, but let's do let's use red. This little area in this box are actually the combs and they're cilia that beat in unison from the uh, aboral end so the aboral end of the organism to the oral end and that essentially just means from the not mouth side to the mouth side um, and then on this aboral end they also have a stratocyst that helps them with equilibrium like we saw similar to the one we saw in cnidarians um, they use their their uh, cilia to move through the water column, so they can swim. But like like most cnidarians, they're not powerful enough to fight a current, uh, especially a strong current. They can't fight it, so they can move, but it's very very weak. And they do swim mouth for first. So in this case, this end of the organism is going first, followed by the aboral end, so oral end first. Um, they are biradially symmetrical and they're diploblastic. But the interesting thing that kind of one thing that separates tenophores from cnidarians is that we talked about in cnidarians when they want to move, they use those epithelial muscular cells. But in tenophores, they don't have that same type of um, method of movement. They actually have true muscle fibers that um, lie between their epidermis and their gastrodermis. And so that's very interesting because it asks, that makes ask questions. It makes scientists ask the question. This is an analogous character, and if so, um, when did the uh, true muscle fibers in tenophores develop? And then where does that leave tenophores in the tree of life, right? Um, it's really interesting to know that they actually have true muscles, and they're such a uh, simple organism. They are monoecious, meaning that they have both male and female uh, gametes, or uh, sperm and egg, in the same organism. And then uh, some have tentacles and some don't. So this image is showing you the bottom image is one that has tentacles. It's tentacles. Um, the one on the top does not. But the ones that do have tentacles, they don't have nematocysts like tenophore, like uh, cnidarians did. Instead, they have something called glue cells. And these cells basically produce an adhesive substance that will stick to the prey, allowing them to catch prey. Um, some tenophores are really smart where they can use nematocysts um, from jellyfish they ate to uh, protect themselves, but they do not produce those uh, nematocysts themselves. So they don't make nidocyte cells. Um, they can steal them, but they don't make them. So how do tenophores feed? Tenophores actually have a complete gut. So when we we're talking about um, the medusas and the polyps, they had an incomplete gut, right? Food goes in, there is no other way out than the way the food came in if there's any waste. Um, in the case of tenophores, they actually have a complete gut. So you can kind of see how we're moving closer and closer to characteristics that we have in more complex animals. They have a mouth and a spharynx, and here's their mouth. And remember that part is the oral end, and when they're swimming, that's the end that goes first. Then they have a pharynx, which will lead to their stomach. And um, from their stomach, it, it branches off into a couple canals. There are um, canals that end and they go up towards the, the mouth. And they have canals that go back towards the stratocyst. And then they veer off into two, basically two anuses. And all of the undigested material and waste material gets removed from that end. So you can see how they have a mouth and they have an anus. So they have a complete gut system. Um, they also undergo inter extracellular and intra intracellular digestion, like we talked about in uh, 
Nidocytes, oh, sorry, and cnidarians, where food gets brought in, the, the gut, the stomach is responsible for breaking that food down. And then um, those smaller pieces are absorbed by the gastrointestinal cells and then um, further broken down so that that organism can use those nutrients. And they uh, undergo uh, cellular respiration and excretion via diffusion. So those, the, the, not the waste that comes out the anus, but the waste that comes from the, the individual cells. So that leads us to the end of chapter 13. I hope you guys learned a lot about jellies. I think that they're quite interesting, especially tenophores. I actually did an internship in Savannah looking at tenophores for 10 weeks. So um, I think clearly I think they're quite interesting. Um, I recommend going ahead and reading chapter 13, sections 13.1, um, particularly the intro, the section on their form, the, the form and function of jellies and the coral reefs. And then if there are any uh, categories, those phyla, I'm sorry, not phyla, those different classes of uh, cnidarians that were of interest to you, please go ahead and read more about them and also read section 13.2. Um, also, uh, go ahead and take the smart book assessment for chapter 13 and watch the any of these videos that you're interested in. So um, I included some videos here, like I mentioned, the how do jellyfish sting is the video that shows you how nematocysts are firing. So when I was talking about it, if it's not really that clear, because it's, it's hard to uh, express orally, but in that video, they have an actual uh, video of kind of a, pic, a cartoon of how nematocysts um, fire. So that's interesting. You can also watch Tenafor swimming, which is really cool. Um, some facts about moon jellies, but that video is actually really good review material for some basic concepts for all jellies in general. Um, and then two videos on just the 101s of coral reefs and jellyfish. And then the last video is not necessarily so related, but um, it is interesting. So there are organisms that eat jellyfish and one of them um, are green turtles and then loggerhead turtles. And so that last one is actually just a video of a green turtle eating a jellyfish. So I hope this is all helpful for you. Um, and I will see you in the next uh, PowerPoint where we'll talk about platyomenthes.